Good evening. This is CTV News for Wednesday, March 29th. I'm Patricia Vallone. And I'm Denise Douglas. Glad you could join us tonight. Individuals with disabilities, advocates, and professional care providers rally in Upper Marlboro calling for much needed funding for the ARC. The county executive left the nonprofit out of his fiscal year 2018 budget. The organization says without funding to help pay staff the county's increased minimum wage, it can't sustain the quality of care required for its vulnerable clients. The staff turnover issue becomes a very important matter to me because my daughter as well as the other clients have difficulty with transitions when staff members leave uh, th that impacts the behavior of my daughter as well as the other clients. Our county minimum wage exceeds the state minimum wage and the state funding that providers in this county receive is based on the state wage rate. So that difference between the county and the state causes a funding impact for us because we're not getting enough resources to pay the higher minimum wage for staff in this county. So we believe it's a temporary issue. We believe the state at some point will catch up. And so really what we're asking the county to do is satisfy a burden and a responsibility that it created. When you look at the fact that it's you know such a small percentage of the overall budget, um, two tenths of a percent, it was 3.5 million out of a 1.6 billion dollar operating budget. First of all, but also um, at the end of this fiscal year, we'll have about 127 million dollar uh, surplus, and that is um, that's unrestricted. We can use that for anything. According to County Executive Rashern Baker, the fight really belongs at the state level. In a statement, he says, quote, the increase of minimum wage has been difficult for the operational budget of all nonprofits. The reimbursement to these nonprofits must come from the state. It is up to Governor Hogan and the Maryland General Assembly to fill the gap, end quote. Environment Maryland issues a new report on the benefits of reducing pollution and calls on Governor Hogan to double the strength of the regional greenhouse gas initiative. The study comes just as President Trump is expected to issue an executive order to reverse many climate efforts. The organization wants Maryland to stay a step ahead of the cleanup effort. Right now, um, the cap on emissions is 2.5% reductions per year. We want Governor Hogan and the rest of the governors in the region to reduce the emissions by 5% per year. So our report looks at exactly what that would mean for um, reducing global warming pollution, investing in clean energy and energy efficiency, and the potential for weatherizing homes all across our state. If you aggregate the states together like this, you actually can make a relatively big impact in the overall national emissions trajectory. Um, it's not the same as doing a federal program, but it's still, it's still very much worth doing. It's the time, because of the urgency of climate change and the, the need to kind of advance these new economic approaches to clean energy, um, I think it's actually a mistake to wait for four or eight years before uh, we re-engage with these very important issues. Over the next few months, Maryland will propose changes to the regional initiative. Those changes will affect the timetable. Power plant operators will have to clean up their emissions over the next decade. Well, as the president signs the executive order that rolls back those environmental protections, one Maryland lawmaker has an alternate alternative plan. U.S. Senator Chris Van Hollen announced a proposal to reintroduce a carbon cap and dividend plan called the Healthy Climate and Family Security Act. The plan puts a price on carbon pollution with proceeds going directly to the American people. The cap and dividend approach has received bipartisan support. Well, the Washington Council of Governments has endorsed a map detailing populations and how that could affect transportation projects. Yeah, in particular, it looks at low-income and minority communities. And Byron Scott joining us right now to tell us more about this. Well, it uses a map. It is called the Equity Emphasis Areas Map. Big word there. Well, COG's been working on that map for a year, a little more, using census records and other information. It highlights items such as population, race, and income. COG will use this information as it an analyzes its long-term transportation goals, which include 300 regional projects. This map will help determine if that plan for year 2040 will have an adverse impact on those areas. We'll go forward as staff and do our analysis of what accessibility and uh, accessibility and mobility mm -hmm. measures are forecast for the, the equity emphasis areas mm -hmm. versus the rest of the region. We've been working at the College for Smarter Growth since the late 90s on this issue. 
It's one of the reasons why we've long supported transit-oriented development at the east side metro stations in the region, in D.C., in Montgomery, mm -hmm. in Prince George's. Uh, and Prince George's has made huge progress in bringing economic development to the east, but it still very much is lagging uh, the amount of growth going to the west side and really far too out on the west side. Well, COG says that it will analyze its plan for 2040 every four years and make adjustments as necessary. A big plan for the region, so a lot of work is going into it. All right. Yep. Great. Thank you, Byron. Thanks a lot, Byron.